everyone, and welcome to this latest webinar from IHS Market titled Cloud CO and Broadband Access, Experience and Vision. Amid extraordinary challenges to make their networks more efficient, telcos seeking to best leverage cloud agility and new technologies like NFV and SDN are turning to the Cloud CO, a central office with a mini data center. So today, our panel will explore best practices, case studies, and the latest findings with this new Cloud CEO approach. Our webinar is co-presented by IHS Market and our partner, Huawei. My name is Alan Tatara, Senior Event Manager for the IHS Market Technology Group webinar team, and I want to thank everyone for joining us. So before we begin, I want to highlight just some of the features available for you on the webinar and how you can make the most of your experience today. So the console that you're looking at is completely customizable. So this means you can open, close, move, or even resize any of the windows that you have open on your screen and arrange the console as you prefer. Now the bottom of your console are a number of application widgets which contain additional features that are available for you. So make sure you check these out during the webinar. I do want to mention the resource list widget, and this is where you will find additional material about our topic, including the downloadable slide deck from today's session, as well as other valuable resources. And all these materials can be accessed and downloaded right from your console. And we do want to make this an interactive session, so we've included a Twitter widget. You'll see that at the bottom of your screen. And this means you'll be able to tweet direct directly from the console. And today we're using the hashtag CloudCO. Now we'll also have a live Q&A session after our presentation, so please make sure you submit your questions or comments at any time by using the Q&A box that is located on the left side of your screen. And if you do encounter any technical issues during the webinar, just click on that question mark widget and you will get the answers that you need. So now let me take this opportunity to introduce to you Michael Howard, who will be leading our discussion today. Michael is Executive Research Director in the Carrier Network segment at IHS Market. So Michael, welcome. Thanks, Alan, and welcome to our friends that are attending the webinar in North America, South America, Europe, and some in Asia. So uh, welcome aboard. Uh, I've been involved with uh, SDN and NFV and actually uh, Edge and Cloud COs for more than 10 years. Uh, so uh, it's a particular area that I've been watching and uh, fascinating to watch it all develop. So uh, we have a great panel today. Uh, I'd like to first introduce uh, George Dobrowski, who's a uh, Huawei, whoops, let me do this. Oops, what happened? Uh, okay. Uh, it, who's a Huawei consultant, a uh, broadband forum fellow, obviously an expert in, in uh, broadband, uh, SDN NFV work area director. So George, welcome. Thank you, Michael. And uh, let me extend my welcome to everyone. And I'm, um, uh, as a little introduction of myself, I've been involved with the broadband forum since before it was known as the broadband forum. And one of the hot topics that uh, we had debates about in the early days was how fast does the access line need to be to be considered broadband? Well, we're well beyond that point today. And just last month, we reached a landmark decision or a landmark point where 1 billion fixed broadband subscribers are now in service. My roots go back to Bell Telephone Laboratories or uh, what is commonly known as uh, Bell Labs, or used to be commonly known as Bell Labs. For all practical purposes, it doesn't exist anymore. So now I work for Huawei. Thank you. Thanks, George. And uh, we have a particular privilege today to have an operator on board, Mauro Tiloka, who's also very deeply involved with the broadband forum work. Uh, Mauro? Thanks, Michael. Uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Mauro Tiloka. I'm Access Network Automation Project Manager within TIMS Innovation Department. Uh, yes, I've been involved uh, since um, uh, two, three years now with the uh, network transformation activities uh, dealing very much uh, with uh, access, so the software defined access network. And uh, I'm, I'm also very much involved in uh, uh, the broadband um, form project that we will uh, uh, touch upon uh, today. 
So I'm, I'm very happy to uh, participate to this webinar today. Thanks. Thanks, Mauro. And so let's get started. Uh, today our agenda includes, I'll do some overview market trends to place uh, the cloud CO in the bigger trends that are going on uh, in telecom. We'll look at some problems and challenges, then some new options and solutions for those challenges. And then Marlo's going to talk about the access abstraction, very important to define the cloud CO. We'll have a couple of slides with sponsor approach. I'll bring some conclusions, and then we'll go to audience Q&A. We designed the webinar to be approximately 45 minutes of content and to leave time open for you, the audience, to ask questions. So we'd like you to ask questions at any point along the way. Uh, just submit them uh, through your window. We'll try to get to them uh, either along the way or more likely at the end during the formal Q&A. So thank you for joining us. So the big picture I see, digital transformation is a big picture. It actually got started with SDN and NFE back in the 2009 and then 2012 time period. Uh, separate the control plane from the user plane, uh, services orchestration, so a lot of software network functions. Distributed telco cloud was actually a piece of the original design and the architecture of it. And what we see is a big piece of where we're going is the network simplification. It involves a lot of pieces, uh, fixed mobile convergence, flatter networks, uh, easy network slicing, disaggregated hardware and software, and open source software. So all these pieces are uh, helping simplify networks and move to the point of, of automation. Automation is the key to digital transformation. And uh, about a year ago, the Etsy uh, uh, carriers got together to form a direct focus on automation called uh, Zero Touch Service uh, autom Zero Touch Automation and Service uh, Management. Uh, and this includes AI and ML and closed loop feedback into the networks, all the things you need for automation of a carrier network, network which is composed of many domains. This leads to digital transformation. It's the goal of enterprises all over the world and operators as well. The key ingredient, two key ingredients, one is improved customer experience. So the customer interactions get automated, they're online. Uh, they can request services uh, online and have those services put into effect right away, but you need an automated network. Today we'll be, we're going to be talking about how to automate the broadband network. And then the second aspect of digital transformation, of course, is the automation of the network, being able to agilely create and deliver new services. So automation is the key to digital transformation. What we found in our research work with carriers around the world is that 85% are planning to deploy many uh, data centers in COs. Uh, so that is servers and storage in cloud COs. Uh, many are already doing this on a small scale. Uh, the majority of operators are planning. So what is a cloud CO? We started tracking this uh, 10 or 12 years ago, what I called back then a next-gen CO, where uh, what were centralized uh, functions in a metro at a central CO or central POP. Uh, BRASs in particular at the time uh, started to be distributed and carriers were planning to select a number of COs out in their uh, metro network and move the IP edge out into that cloud CO. Uh, a number of functions uh, then uh, uh, got put out there, caching, CDNs, etc., and uh, then uh, carriers started adding small data centers, a small rack or a couple of racks, depending on the CO size, uh, uh, really of a mini data center in these selected COs. Uh, and so that uh, brought the term smart CO, so a CO with smarts in it, a small data center. So. Uh, Carriers are offering cloud services. Uh, it's a place where they're running and, and more planning to run virtualized network functions. We'll hear more about that today. Uh, like virtual routers, the virtual broadband network gateway, firewall, CGNet, and more. 
uh, and it's a place to locate the disaggregated broadband hardware and software. And then just to put Edge in the bigger picture, uh, sorry, the CO in the bigger picture, in this work we, ha we bring some data from another study uh, where we looked at the edge and access defined. So broadband access on the left side is one part, but also mobile access and, and uh, other types of fixed access. But what we see is operators are planning to, uh, if you look in the kind of the middle, there's a smart CO with uh, a cloud CO with a mini data center and an edge data center. 97% of operators plan DNF executions in these smart COs in another study we did. So here's the important uh, plans of operators using that cloud CO. Okay, so now we're gonna look at, that's the end of my overview, we're gonna now look at the problems and challenges and George is gonna lead us through this, George. Thank you, Michael. So there are certainly a number of challenges associated with how do you realize the digital transformation of the current broadband network? And some of these challenges are highlighted on this slide, you know, and as Michael already indicated, the need for agility and provisioning of services to be more responsive to the customer needs, the ability to migrate to new service generating um, data models, while maintaining coexistence with the current embedded network, which is the uh, paying for the bills. Merging of communications technology and information technology for integrated ICT management, while the edges of the network are evolving with focuses going beyond the existing fixed wireline solution. So let's look at the not so quiet revolution in broadband networking. A holistic broadband is a commitment that FORM has made that results in a set of deliverables that provide standardized platforms, frameworks, software, technical specifications, and interoperability test, uh, testing for implementations. It spans from access and backhaul infrastructures to 5G, virtualization, software-defined networking, cloud-based central offices, home and business networks. So very broad scope. It draws on the work and expertise and experience of the broadband forum, who I might emphasize is the broadband forum is the defined the current broadband network by developing the many technical specifications that we publish and, um, we, and there are different specs that are issued to introduce different technologies into the network with testing and certification being important. The broadband forum does not work alone it does not have the not invented here attitude. It leverages and works with partner organizations to apply technologies and approaches to enable high quality interoperable solutions. So those other organizations are not only other standards organizations or SDOs, but also now in, this, in the new world, open source organizations. For example, we're examining the entire architecture in context of how wireline networks work today how wireline networks are expected to work in the future, and how we're going to hook or migrate them together. One of the organizations we're also collaborating with is the 3GP, the 3GPP organization, to introduce and support 5G technologies. We're looking to make recommendations to 3GPP on additional enhancements that would be required to fully integrate wireline access to the 5G core. That means converged infrastructure, converged operations, and based on Cloud CO framework. A final point, the current, broad, uh, current deployed broadband network is made up of a large number of monolithic network solutions. The holistic broadband approach is not focused on monolithic systems, you know, which tend to focus on specific closed solutions. The, the approach represents a pivot point unifying open source with Cloud CO standards. Now this slide talked a little bit about the um, virtualized broadband cloud CO program. It's um, a system design combining network function virtualization, software defined, defined networks, and cloud consumption interfaces. It leverages compute and networking platform 
It includes access and network facing I.O. connections directly to top of rack switches. It utilizes NFV to virtualize the network functions that previously lived in a monolithic system. The application of virtualization allows disaggregation of physical network functions coupled with SDN control. It offers cloud-like application program interfaces for third-party service onboarding and delivery of wired and wireless services. These activities involve the new open broadband environment. I'm sorry, just noticed that the jump thing was jumping ahead. <laughs> okay, so uh, on this slide here, uh, these activities um, in, involve the new open broadband environment, which I'll talk about further in just uh, a moment. Okay, on this slide, the cloud-based central office program defines black boxes of functionality without detailing how it is achieved. We reuse well-known concepts and standards to find new interfaces between them that did not exist in the old monolithic environment. With this change in focus and deliverables, that the new deliverables that result from this work, it shifts the responsibility to the system operator or system integrator or the operator to make choices between open source solutions versus vendor provided software for any of the functional black box boxes to onboard and build their service. So it's a little bit like a puzzle. You, put, you can put different pieces together and uh, to build up the service that you want. It's important to note that in early on the broadband form cloud program, we made a decision that it was also essential to address the coexistence with and the migration from the legacy broadband systems to the new architectural framework. One of the hot debates that we had was agreeing, how do you define a central office? Once you start to virtualize it, disaggregate the functions, you apply SDN control to it, and with the central offices also becoming mini data centers as was talked about before. This led to the development of the cloud-based central office reference architecture framework, which is published in technical report 384. So the TR nomenclature refers to technical reports. These are publicly available documents available on the Broadband Forum's site. This work builds on the Etsy NFV documents, plus it supplements them with new additional functions and interfaces. To highlight some of the key aspects of this, it includes the Cloud CO Domain Orchestrator, which manages control and orchestrates each of the cloud domains, and the End Service Orchestrator, which coordinates all the client interfaces with regard to the privileges, the views, and coordinates among multiple smaller CO domain orchestrators. SDN Manager and Controller directly accesses the network function virtualization infrastructure which is identified as the NFVI at the bottom of this diagram. So the, that NFVI contains the resources that are needed to be able to provide a service, and, and, it, and the controllers manage the resources that are provided by those particular uh, uh, physical characteristics of that element. The management control orchestrator engine is made up of component Cloud CO domain orchestrators, that reflect a reflects the continuum of management, control, and orchestration uh, tasks. The PNF, which stands for Physical Network Functions, and VNF, Virtual Network Function, SDN Managers and Controllers, are res <coughs> excuse me, responsible for the fault creation or configuration, accounting, performance, security, and flow control management functions. Now, pulling all this stuff together, makes up the cloud CO domain. It is an ensemble of network, network, compute, storage, and application components that have to come together and work to deliver networking services. And are orchestrated by a single cloud CO domain orchestrator with a common cloud CO northbound interface. Further with this architectural framework, 
All of the functions do not need to be centrally located. Cloud CEO can be made up of disaggregated functions spread out geographically. And this is one of the hot debate points that uh, came up. So central office now is no longer the single box in, in the building in one location. It is now and can be geographically dispersed. Now, also, let me explain a little terminology on this slide about the, the cloud CEO projects and the work stack uh, that goes into this uh, project. Again, as I indicated before, TR re represents technical reports, and uh, they get assigned a number, and they are published by the broadband forum and are freely available on the website to anybody that wants them. Now, the WT terminology that's in here, uh, WT stands for working text. The working texts are specifications that are in development, and, um, and only once we feel that the development of that spec is completed and the membership gets to vote and approve the specification does it become a TR. So WT is a work in progress, and uh, some of the things what I'm going to talk about and, and reference on this work stack, some are actually, since we put this slide together, you know, some are already out for, for final approval, others are still in the process. So as you can see, this, there are a number of deliverables that make up the Cloud CEO program. Once the framework was established and dozens of use cases and scenarios were scoped out, because everybody wanted to know, you know, what is, what is this new network going to do or be able to do? So once we've scoped some of that out, the focus was on describing the Cloud CEO application notes. The application notes define the implementation of use cases from the operator perspective. And when I say operator perspective, it says, how, what does the service look like? What does it feel like? What, what needs to be included? What are the assumptions in the service? And what are the preconditions? What are the actors that are needed to offer that service? Interactions between different uh, uh, functions also need to be defined. So it's a high-level view from an operator perspective that says, I want to offer service X, Y, Z. And then there's a whole template of what you need to define to be able to offer that service. We then take those application notes, and we use them to make sure that the interfaces, and I indicated earlier, there are many new interfaces that never existed before. So we make sure that all the interfaces that you need to support that application are, in fact, fully and completely defined. And that involves a couple of the working texts, which identify here as WT411 and WT413. The application notes also drive the development of test cases, which is in WT412. And the test cases validate the Cloud CO infrastructure to support the decomposition and virtualization of the cloud functions as defined in TR384 for that particular application. The question of how to migrate your existing broadband form network and how the existing embedded mm -hmm. infrastructure coexists with your new generation of network is being addressed in working text number 408, which is identified as migration. With this framework, we also start on access and home network operations and management automation uh, with intelligence. So you, you know, uh, Michael talked about some of the things going on with regard to automation and the application of mach machine learning. That is also now going into the structure of the Cloud CEO program. In addition, we're defining requirements for a whole new generation of NetConf-enabled access nodes. The joining of the Helco open source community and the traditional standards for reference implementation is an essential key aspect of what serve, uh, what's needed for service providers to transform their networks. It's something Broadband Forum has been uh, preaching about uh, since its strategy meetings and workshops that were conducted in 2016. Now, in 2016, we opened and hosted um, open workshops uh, multiple organizations participated in that, as well as our you know, members that are active in the broadband forum. And it was, I would consider, kind of a watershed year. Because up until that point, and as Mike, uh, Michael indicated earlier, some of the SDN and NAV stuff has been going on for years. 
but everybody was doing their own thing. You had dozens of proprietary pseudo-standard implementations, but because there were no complete specifications, um, everybody was doing their own thing. You have different SDOs. Everybody's claiming I'm doing virtualization or I'm doing software-defined networks or whatever, but everybody was different. Different open source organizations. There are a ton of open source organizations, but which are the right ones to be working with and which ones will be applicable to the Cloud CO uh, architecture? So we work with, with a number of those organizations. We don't um, care where the good ideas come from, but the broadband forum is pulling it all together so that you can actually build a real network. So the, um, a lot of this activity, we realized we also needed to have um, a, 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 a parallel focus or another focus, which we refer to as open broadband. And while the broadband forum you know, did a pivot, and has done a pivot to open source software, marrying it with the standards waterfall approach, it has really helped to unify the open source and cloud CO standards. Along with the debate about what defines a central office, we needed to consider how will we know if it works when you put it all together. There are a lot of moving parts. There are more moving parts now than ever before. This led to the open broadband program, the collaborative space, for the integration and testing of open source, standards-based, and vendor-provided vendor implementations. You will continue to have vendor um, differentiation on, on these different solutions. So you're gonna have a mix and match of standards, open source, and, and also vendor proprietary solutions. It's a place where the suppliers and operators can work together on new coexisting solutions. This required us to also establish the open broadband laboratories. It is an open lab with common hardware and software platform that is used to instantiate Cloud CO solutions and conduct testing, especially if you're doing testing between um, uh, some differentiated vendor solutions and standard solutions. You have to make sure they all work. Um, there are three locations for these labs. There's one in Asia, one in Europe, and one in, in North America. But the details of all these um, uh, labs is not yet fully available, but the Asia lab uh, details are available. And if you go to the Barband Forum website, you can get some more details about that. So the open broadband program is also open to the entire industry. So why do we call it open? Because you don't have to be a member of the Broadband Forum to participate. It helps because that's the only way you, you're on the leading edge of all the new requirements or the new source code that's being developed. But you don't have to be. So there'll be people that will be able to take advantage of the open broadband laboratories, do some, some of their own testing. And that testing is done um, under the, uh, the, the lab is responsible for the, whatever financial terms and conditions are necessary uh, for that. The, the Broadband Forum does not sponsor it or, or, or host, host it. These are independent laboratories that have a history of uh, testing and certification. But it, and it's, we make it open to the uh, uh, entire industry, whether you're a Broadband Forum member or not. So the suppliers and operators can work together on new coexisting solutions on the integration and testing of open source, standards-based, and the vendor-provided implementation. All right, and in a few minutes now, we're going to uh, talk and have an example of how open source and standards are working together. Well, thank you, George, and uh, let me say that uh, I like this approach. Uh, some, there's over 600 operators of all sorts around the world, and about 70% of them uh, offer broadband services of some sort. So it's an important industry move to have the coalescence of operators and vendors working together to find a common way uh, to achieve the the next generation of networking uh, for for broadband. If there is no standardization, then we wind up with what George called, you know, proprietary pseudo standard uh, implementations, and lots of them. So the way for the industry to be more efficient 
and have uh, competition among vendors uh, is to have a common approach. And so I really like this cloud CO approach. Uh, it's it's really key to making the whole industry go forward. So with that, uh, let's dig into some more of the details. And Marl is going to come on board here and talk about the access abstraction. Marl? Yes. Thanks, Michael. So uh, abstraction uh, is, 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 is a very well-known concept in telecommunication networks. It, it's been around since years and years, uh, whereas the concept of access abstraction is taking up since, uh, I would say, a uh, um, couple of years. Now, let's, uh, let, let's uh, see what, what this is about. Uh, and, and why when it brought an access abstraction. Uh, uh, linking back to uh, the digital transformation that uh, Michael described before, uh, the access segment requires special care uh, due to the specifics of transmission technologies and uh, historically uh, that there has been a disparity of access node management interfaces among vendors. Uh, Broadband access abstraction uh, uh, it's been introduced as a uh, software layer uh, that uh, is a mediation component of the software-defined access network, and it exposes a vendor-agnostic and technology-independent view of access resources. So before getting into more detail about uh, its characteristics and functionalities, I'd like to uh, uh, get back to the cloud C overall context and uh, uh, see how the BAA fits into this context. So linking a little bit uh, back to um, uh, George's description of the Cloud CO uh, architecture that you see again in the rightmost side of the slide, uh, uh, we uh, start from, from the top uh, with uh, uh, the end-to-end um, -to -end service orchestration that gets down to the Cloud CO domain which is uh, an, an access and edge domain that leverages uh, uh, NFV, SDN technologies, and a cloud-like infrastructure. Uh, so it exposes uh, resources as a service via the node-bound API. And then uh, via the orchestrator and SDN subsystem, the access resources, PNFs and DNFs, can be controlled. And uh, that's, uh, uh, that's in the uh, access domain that uh, uh, we introduce the BA layer, which acts uh, as a mediation layer towards the access physical network functions. If, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, left side of the picture, then you can see uh, some more detail about uh, the functionalities of the BA layer. Uh, it implements device configuration, profile, control policies uh, uh, that are applied based on the comments received, for example, uh, by the uh, northbound element, uh, uh, the access SDN manager controller as shown in the picture. And uh, in this case, it acts mainly as an actuator, uh, which is one of the options that uh, uh, has been um, developed in the OBBAA project I will talk about uh, later. And then uh, within the uh, OBDA project, also another uh, technical uh, option has been identified uh, to implement the, this layer, which is something that incorporates more the intelligence of a manager controller. And in this case, we call uh, this uh, unified access manager. So uh, w one single mean, one single management and control chain to address uh, multiple uh, um, um, FTTX scenarios in multiple technologies. Now, let's have a look at the characteristics of the BA layer. So, uh, the architecture and functionalities of the BA layer uh, uh, allow an, a number, uh, um, an implement a number of, of uh, uh, characteristics. So, the first one is adaptation. So, the BA layer uh, allows, by means of adapter, to plug uh, different kinds of equipment, uh, even uh, legacy access nodes, as well as uh, new designs into uh, uh, a whole SDN uh, environment. Uh, the, the, the second key characteristic is persistency. As you see here, uh, a data store that represents the access resource is, um, appears rather than uh, uh, just in the 
physical access box inside the BAA uh, core. And this allows to issue and verify configurations and commands to this very data store before uh, uh, pushing them down to the node. So the node could even be in offline mode and uh, it could receive comments later on, which allows, as I as mentioned, uh, persistency and uh, to implement a number of tasks uh, in, in a better way, as I will explain later. The third point is, is uh, the, the key and, 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 and new aspect, that's abstraction. So that's the ability to just expose, uh, uh, if, if needed, only a layer two uh, view of the network. So a vendor and technology agnostic view of the, the access node, which is just one switch as part of a, a multi-stage switch together with uh, other, other equipment in the network, like the transport and, and the edge. And of course, uh, this enables a true end-to-end -end flow automation because the access is represented as part of a layer two or even a high layer, layer chain. Finally, uh, uh, the uh, layer one and, and equipment inventory uh, capabilities are, are not left behind. So the BA layer is also able to expose a layer one um, view of the network. And in, in this case, the decoupling of uh, these two types of interfaces allows them to decouple activities uh, uh, mainly related to service automation uh, uh, versus network cooperation. Now, let's look at uh, uh, the benefits that are enabled by uh, the BA layer and, and the characteristics that I've just described. So let's, let's consider, for example, uh, well, the, the, uh, an important uh, part of the ecosystem, um, I mean, uh, the, the one that I love most, of course, network operators and service providers, so to say. Sorry, George. Uh, we certainly can identify a number of advantages by the use of, of the BA layer, because the BA layer uh, uh, reduces the risk of introducing new technologies and new products or vendors uh, because uh, um, the uh, implementation of standardized access, uh, access nodes, data models, uh, uh, allows manufacturers and operators to be on the same uh, line from the uh, design development and all the, uh, all the, all the phases of the um, development chain. Uh, it reduces the risk of migrating from a, a traditional network management to a network automation architecture because it enables uh, management and control tasks which, again, are based on standardized northbound interfaces and uh, which rely on the automation features of NetConf and RESTConf protocols as well as uh, uh, YAM modeling that contains uh, uh, in, important features related to uh, validation of the data models of the semantics and the syntax of the data model. Uh, it uh, reduces the cost of validation, engineering, and operation because the, the whole de development chain is streamlined and uh, uh, it intrinsically provides a, a, a software automated pre-production and production environment. Uh, it, uh, it also allows to remove the need of multiple proprietary management systems. So we go towards a unified management and control chain via uh, a single mediation platform that is able to manage uh, access devices from different manufacturers. And, and certainly this is a, a key breakthrough with respect to the traditional way uh, operators manage their networks. Now if we move a little farther in the uh, uh, production chain for network operators and service providers, so looking at field operation, the software defined access network that uh, uh, the BAA exposes uh, to higher level uh, uh, elements in, 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 the, in, in the control chain, uh, for example, FDN controllers or uh, uh, the very OSS systems, well, this, uh, this kind of exposure guarantees uh, a, a much more efficient execution of, uh, of typical network operation processes. So daily activities can be carried out uh, uh, in a much less error-prone fashion, uh, not relying, uh, uh, necessarily relying on human intervention, but on the uh, uh, multi-thread, multi-task operation uh, related to uh, management protocols like NetConf, RESTConf. And uh, needless to say, this translates into uh, a, 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 an overall reduced cost to run the network platform and the services that it provides. Uh, which, which is very key in, 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 a, in a window where the marginality in, in, 
in uh, you know running and selling services is reducing. Uh, also, the production and deployment of access service, services can gain very much uh, by the uh, uh, introduction of the abstraction layer and, uh, and software defined access network. Uh, because uh, service providers can develop traditional and innovative services uh, 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 very easily. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, resource abstraction allows to plan, develop, and deploy access services in a way that as I mentioned before, is decoupled from uh, the underlying equipment and technologies. Uh, and, and, and so the same service can be uh, engineered one, once and for all at the beginning of time and then can be simply reparametrized and adapted to uh, a new FTTX scenario. So for example, moving from FTT cap to FTTH and uh, the underlying technologies. And, and, and this, of course, applies, for example, to uh, a flavor update uh, 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 of the phone technology in, in an already existing FTTH scenario. Uh, finally, just going before, uh, uh, before going live, uh, this kind of, of framework allows to pre-check uh, a service or a feature on the real network platform uh, just before going live and then uh, pushing the button and uh, um, um, spreading out a new configuration, a new service on different vendors', key, vendors equipment through the unique BA interface. Uh, and and uh, again, uh, this clearly translates into improved and, and more predictable time to market. Now, looking at, uh, uh, at um, a wider set of benefits uh, for, for, for the whole ecosystem, and so also the, the benefits to manufacturers, uh, certainly manufacturers as well as network operators are going to have uh, a, a much easier life with BAA, as uh, uh, BAA uh, enables a seamless migration of the legacy devices into a new programmable network environment, so a, a very first step into the new world of automation. Uh, and and that, this is thanks, uh, thanks to the adapters. But at the same time, the BAA can support new disaggregated access node designs and, and, and certainly allowing operators to make their own choice about uh, whatever solution and central office infrastructure design they consider most convenient or, or most effective with respect to uh, the overall constraints of the transformation equation. Uh, in other words, we, we, can, we, can, we could say that BAA allow, allow, allows uh, the coexist, coexistent strategies of legacy uh, and new designs for the access nodes and allows uh, to um, tune uh, 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 one's own uh, migration plan, uh, being that smooth or steep. Uh, network operators can upgrade their infrastructure incrementally rather than uh, uh, make a, a big decision on a, a, a total replacement uh, based approach. Uh, and uh, uh, this is just because uh, uh, new, new technologies and new vendors uh, can be supported by the BAA by updating the set of data models that describe, that describe the resources and of course, uh, getting, uh, uh, updating the library of device-specific adapters provided by the vendors. Uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, this allows to play uh, uh, in, in, in a much more sophisticated and granular, uh, granular way on uh, upgrade and investment strategies. Uh, service providers can uh, deploy services more rapidly, as I mentioned before, uh, because again, uh, uh, regardless of the current status of the network and, and the dependencies of technologies, uh, the, uh, the same service offer can be just pushed down through uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, SDN chain uh, very easily. And at the same time, uh, the, uh, the suppliers, so the manufacturers, can streamline and cost optimize their development uh, because they, they would support standard interface that, so they wouldn't need to, to make customized uh, developments for uh, 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 different service providers or SSs. And again, this, this of course uh, represents a, a, a tremendous economy of scale in the manufacturer's uh, development chain. And, and finally, uh, uh, vendors and service providers can uh, talk the same language, refer to the same set of um, uh, uh, 
uh, standards interface, but at the same time have the ability, thanks to uh, interface programmability or the support of specific extensions to differentiate themselves uh, on the access products for the manufacturers or on the access services that uh, can be implemented on this um, e uh, evolutionary platform. Now, let me talk a little bit of uh, what, what uh, George uh, briefly mentioned before. Uh, that's the OBBAA project. So this is a pr one project under the umbrella of the bigger uh, Broadband Forums Open Broadband Initiative. Uh, which, uh, and, and, and this project develops a reference implementation of the broadband access abstraction layer that I've just described as a key component in the Cloud CO uh, framework. So uh, uh, this, um, this open source project uh, 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 provides, uh, uh, provides uh, uh, open source code uh, under an Apache 2.0 source code license and uh, it also uh, produces as uh, deliverables a set of requirement specifications and guidelines to use the code uh, uh, under the uh, Broadband Forms IPR policy, uh, which, which is great uh, as a, an overall framework of uh, um, a very clear uh, uh, IPR uh, um, provisions and, 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 in general speaking, rules of engagement. And the documentation, along with the code, allows developers to take the distribution and product announced, so to add value to the, the source code uh, uh, as, as, uh, as per the, uh, the deeds of their business. Uh, what, uh, what the BAA, uh, OBBAA project provides uh, is a platform that allows the uh, virtualization of access node management. Uh, and uh, uh, it, uh, it, it is a, a key element that can be fit into uh, the mixed match setups that George mentioned before uh, to uh, demonstrate and, and, and uh, eventually go into field uh, cloud CO uh, type of, of uh, design and, and solution. Uh, the, um, as mentioned, in interoperability is guaranteed towards the northbound system is guaranteed because uh, uh, the uh, uh, open source code is based on compliance to uh, those WTs that uh, George mentioned before, uh, mainly the uh, WT413, which is the set of interfaces uh, towards the uh, uh, access nodes. And uh, uh, the, the, the core is based on the uh, implementation interaction uh, uh, with data stores that are based on uh, the YAM models that the Broadband Forum uh, uh, has specified, also uh, leveraging on uh, existing uh, data models, for example, from uh, IETF. So uh, uh, spending some, some, some words on the uh, production pipe of the project. So the... Uh, uh, the OBBA project works like uh, uh, like any open source project uh, uh, with, via continuous integration and continuous development uh, uh, kind of approach based on, on agile methodologies and uh, uh, a very time constrained sprint. Uh, the project uh, tree team uh, is composed by a remarkable community of players. Uh, I'm, I'm, ha I'm very happy uh, with that, with uh, uh, a number of service providers, with incumbent and disruptive manufacturers working together, and also labs that allow also to, uh, to check the, uh, the solutions and, and, and feedback, uh, comments, and results uh, uh, to, to the team. Uh, the initial work was based on a foundational specification uh, that uh, uh, in some sense answers to key uh, technical and operational knots related to migration towards the full software-defined access network. And I have to say that it was uh, inspired by uh, uh, the, the, um, the experience and, and some innov innovative aspects that uh, uh, were developed uh, in, 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 in the, by the Volta community, but also looking at some, uh, some of those gaps that were perceived in the, that kind of path. Uh, and uh, uh, this, I think, is, is also a great way of, uh, of interaction and synergy uh, between uh, open standards and open source. Uh, 
uh, in terms of um, uh, delivery, uh, I'm, I'm very proud to say that in barely nine months, so from January down to October, uh, uh, two re releases were um, uh, were made available, and, and the last one was uh, showcased the Broadband World Forum demonstrating a multi-vendor, multi-technology setup. So really uh, uh, get into reality uh, those uh, those uh, benefits and those fundamentals that I uh, uh, spoke about before. Uh, to improve the consumption of uh, OBBA distributions, uh, uh, the, there is a, a bold requirement, and uh, as a story team lead of the project, uh, I, I, I really uh, underline uh, the importance of that, uh, that uh, consumers of the open source code should be able also to consume uh, uh, a full release package made also of uh, documentation and reproducible scripts that allow to build up a sandbox and, 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 and play, but even more than play, uh, really work on the code and add value uh, uh, to it. Uh, the, uh, this is a, a, a thrilling experience, and uh, I think that uh, the OBBA project is really laying the foundation for a unique platform under, under which traditional and disaggregated access designs can coexist together, and hopefully, uh, as, uh, as talks are going on, also bringing closer together the Volt and SIBA uh, community uh, uh, and the OBBA uh, uh, team to uh, really serve uh, the industry towards uh, the software divine, defined access network goals. Uh, this brings me, brings me to uh, a very brief uh, summary on so Mauro. Uh, yeah. Uh, Mauro, <clears throat> we're running a little behind on time, and we want to leave time for uh, audience Q and A. And I'd like to remind our audience that please do submit your questions. We have a number of questions in. But please do submit your own questions now uh, as we head towards the Q&A part. So let me suggest to be uh, pretty brief on, on this uh, slide and uh, as we move through to get to uh, time for Q&A. Thanks, Mauro. Oh, okay. Then in this case, uh, I'd like to focus just on, on the last two bullets, which I kind of are kind of new. So sorry, guys. Uh, uh, I'll skip the summary part, but uh, I'd like to underline that uh, uh, th there is uh, a number of projects and, and there is a tremendous amount of work being done that, by the Broadband Forum, uh, also in terms of cross-organizational co cooperation. Uh, there are MOUs and, 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 and talks with OPNFV, ONF, uh, ONAP communities, and, and I, I think that the key goal of, of this, this overall ecosystem should be to reduce fragmentation and dispersion and uh, at the high level, look at uh, uh, um, the, uh, the goal of building up a robust and long-term sustainable ecosystem. Uh, certainly, I, I love to spread out the message that uh, just uh, blending together the strengths of open source and open standards, uh, uh, we, we can really funnel this uh, uh, tremendous wave of innovation that we are uh, witnessing in, in, in this uh, last years uh, into uh, really consumable carry grade solutions. So, well, uh, everyone is welcome to uh, uh, to be involved in, in, um, in all these projects, projects and uh, uh, exciting uh, activities uh, shaping up the future of broadband and cloud access. Uh, thank you, Mauro, and you're one of the key contributors to that. But the uh, the the strength is that there's many operators and many vendors working on this, so they're building a common approach for broadband service providers to have a platform to move forward to actually have a platform that, where they can innovate new services quickly uh, and, and they can also develop common practices across the industry. And that allows uh, the vendors to focus on when there's a common open source, it speeds development of the common functions by the force of a community behind it, uh, and that allows the vendors to focus on more differentiated functions. Uh, so automation is really complex, and it's only possible if there's a common approach, a common platform on which to uh, base a 
uh, automation. So with that, thank you and submit your questions. So sponsor approach, George, uh, Huawei's involved here. Huawei's been a heavy sponsor of the, of one of the many sponsors, but a heavy sponsor for the activities at the broadband forum. So uh, tell us about the position of, of uh, Huawei here. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'll be brief so we can get a few questions in, but uh, Mauro did a great job of describing the broadband access abstraction uh, activities in the broadband forum, which is all part of the open broadband program that we have. And to give you a sense of how real this is, um, is that currently in the OBBAA, which is the Open Broadband Broadband Access Abstraction Activities, that's an open source activity, there are 17 operators and vendors working on the BAA open source code. So I think that's pretty significant. Uh, this also illustrates the pivot point that the forum has made. And I think of the Broadband Forum now as a hybrid organization. It's not just traditional standard. It's not just open source, but it unifies the two areas of activities. Regarding um, Huawei's role in uh, this work, as this slide kind of highlights, the fact that Huawei was the first one to propose the Cloud CEO concept a number of years ago and, and help kick off the projects in the broadband form. And uh, as the title slide earlier indicated, I'm co-director of the work area that's developing the specifications for the implementation of the Cloud CEO and the Next Generation Broadband Network. And we also have provide the vice chair uh, for the OBBAA uh, open source development team, as well as contributing to that team. Finally, Huawei has uh, been involved uh, and was the first to do testing to instantiate the Cloud CO program in the open broadband laboratory that I had talked about earlier that was established. The first one was in Asia, and uh, the testing was done in the Asia OBO uh, location earlier this year. Thanks, Thank George. That's so. Uh, now I'm going to quickly go through the. We're at the end. So automation is the key to digital transformation. The cloud CO is really an important part of new edge access architecture for service delivery. The BAA is an important part of the new cloud CO architecture, and the BAA allows uh, automation, enables automation via vendor agnostic and technology independent abstraction layer. Those are the key elements. So. We're going to now go to audience Q&A, uh, and we're going to start right up here. Go ahead and submit more questions. If we don't get them all answered now, uh, we will uh, be able to answer them afterwards. So uh, first question in here, uh, how does Cloud CO compare to the work being done by Linux Foundation with Cord and Residential Cord? How does Cloud CO work with the Cord group? Okay, this this is George. I'll take first cut at it, and then I'll let Mauro also comment on it. And but first, I want to make sure that everybody understands and realizes that the Linux Foundation is um, um, involved with multiple open source organizations. In fact, on Mauro's slide, I think it was his conclusion slide, he identifies some of those, and that includes the uh, ONF um, and 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 others, and the uh, so the the um, I'll say the uh, cloud, uh, the uh, cord activities represent an approach that was uh, been, that's progressing along that can actually coexist with the the BAA. And in fact, there are some scenarios where the cord approach actually will probably want to use the BAA as part of its solution. But I want to emphasize that the the cord approach doesn't implement all of the functionality that people may like to have in, in, in a, say, an, an OLT. And it also focuses on, on the greenfield approach. It, it's not concerned about how do you in, uh, interface a uh, Volta SIBA pod with uh, the existing network. That has not been part of this migration and coexistence, as Morrow indicated in his talk several times. That was not one of the considerations. So if you're if you going to be greenfield and, and it's going all new, that's fine, Just but, but now you're deploying a greenfield network that's not linked into the existing network. Um, we are, as Mara also indicated, we as BBF organization has been working 
with the ONF organization and the uh, uh, Cord Volta SEBA folks, and we hope to have a press release out very, very soon. I don't know if we'll make it this week, next week, but, but we've been working and collaborating together on how the pieces will fit together. But there is a different scope between the court approach and the BAA approach. Did you want to add anything? Okay, to that, good. Well, let yeah, oh. let me. Uh, we're at the end of time, but let me ask one quick question tomorrow, and that is: uh, uh, Is the open broadband BAA open source code available to the public yet? Sure, sure. I, I guess that's uh, uh, <laughs> rule one uh, for an open open source project. So uh, it is. Uh, there, uh, it's uh, actually available. It's actually available uh, on on a link. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah, yeah. There, well, there's that, a link. I think it's ob ob dash baa dash dash broadband uh, form uh, dot org. But anyway, uh, we can make it available. But of course, yes, the uh, this is available to the public. So uh, uh, the latest release is available together with all the uh, uh, documentation and and guides uh, and and example scripts for everyone to really try the code. Great. So perfect. So that uh, ends the content, but first uh, let me uh, uh, turn control back to Alan. Any final comments, Alan? Yes, thank you, Michael. And I also want to thank our panel for leading and being a part of our discussion today, and Michael for leading our discussion. Uh, thank you for submitting your questions and comments. Uh, the panel will be following up with you after the webinar. So an archived version of this webinar will be made available shortly, and so feel free to come back, view this session again, or even share it with your colleagues. Now you will see a short survey pop up at the conclusion of our webinar, so please take a few moments to fill that out. And continue to follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn for information on future IHS Market Technology Group webinars. So again, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.